today is the sixth day of this August, September 1984 seven day retreat. And we will talk about death. life and death. Because even though we think of life and death as a polarity, two opposites, life here and death at the other end, maybe this is an assumption. Maybe life and death are not separate or separable. Many people have mentioned to me that the reason that they have come to a Zen center, not this one, but another one before this one. It was because something had been read about transcending life and death. About attaining an experience in which one goes beyond life and death. living as we used to recite at the end of every sashin, striving that one may live, if I quote it correctly, past day, past death, which is a very great attraction to the human mind, to live past death. and past day, the difficulties and miseries, fears, problems of the day, living past that and past death in some other kind of dimension. In which one and one thinks, when one thinks about this as oneself, as one feels oneself now, as an individual entity living beyond death. Without problems. Some people have told me I'm not afraid of death. I've seen many people dying. I've been with many people dying. These were nurses in this case. But other people have told me I'm not afraid of death. I'll meet it when it comes. Or if one says, I've seen many people dying, maybe it means for that person, death by having seen people die is something known to me. And since it is known, I don't need to be afraid of it. I've seen it. In another person another person passing away. Actually, in talking about death today, I'm not primarily concerned with talking about death at the end of one's life, when the heart stops, no more oxygen in the brain, 
and the organism is finished. This may be preceded by a lot of pain, maybe years of pain and sickness, suffering, disease. And how one will face it, no one knows. It, it can only happen in, in the doing of it, in the, in the being that pain. But to the extent that fear is not there, it will be easier. That one can test by being faced with pain today, right now. That the fear of it, which is squirming, a physical squirming, ten tension against or bracing against, the pain, if it comes into awareness and drops away, the pain itself is, becomes much more bearable and unproblematic because the conflict with it is removed, is gone. And many, many people have experienced this, that conflict with a situation is the greatest pain. Pain itself, if it is there in its bareness, is something different than if it is surrounded by fear and resistance. And these surrounding layers of fear and resistance can be looked into, seen and drop away. What is fear of dying or fear of death as one looks into the mind itself where the fear is produced as well as the idea of death and dying? Because unless at this instant there is this process of dying going on, at which moment one may not even call it that, unless that is happening right now, dying and death is a concept, an idea in the mind. Does one see that? And associated with this idea, this concept, may be a feeling of great uncertainty. What is it? Really not knowing it, but wanting to know it, wanting to bring this unknown thing, this unknown event, into the sphere of the known, namely able to think about it. That is the sphere of the known. It is all one's memories of what one knows, has heard and read, and the thoughts that spring out of that. And here is something that thought is unable to deal with. Although we will go into how thought does deal with it later on. But for the moment, let us just understand in, in watching this mind that thought, thinking, cannot understand dying. Because dying is the ending of thinking.
unless one fabricates thoughts and ideas about dying and death and what may happen after death, dying and death is a great unknown quantity thing. I don't know what word to put to it. Unknown, unknowable. Somebody may say, but I do remember my past death before I was born into this life. But that is memory. And where that memory comes from, one may not know. Or one may think one knows, but it may not be actual fact. When thought cannot grasp something, is at, at a loss to deal with something, to, to make something known to itself, anxiety often results. Most of the time, a, a queasy feeling, feeling of, well, yeah, anxiety uncertainty, which is a mild or strong agitation of the mind, trying to do something which it is unable to do, a frustration, or outright fear. Because all our life long, we have dealt with things we know, meaning we recognize, we have a memory of, knowledge about, and some skill to deal with it, more or less. And here's the thought of death that one cannot deal with by thinking about it. On the contrary, every time one thinks about it, There may be this uneasiness, discomfort, anxiety, or fear of what it may be. Connected with this is the idea that the me as one thinks about oneself in terms of me, I, myself, will come to an end. That one can think about that the me in dying comes to an end, will not continue. That which in retrospect, perusing one's memories of oneself in images like looking through a photo album, that this me which has grown from a baby through childhood, adolescence, manhood, womanhood, middle age, old age, or wherever one is now, that this me may very likely come to an end. And if one looks, quietly, openly, freely, one realizes one doesn't want this to come to an end. One wants to continue as one knows oneself and as one would like to be in the future. So in this continuity of the past is also what one would like to become in the future rather than die too early before one has become that. So the fear of dying is the fear of something unknown and the fear of what one knows as idea and memory, because this is what me is. If 
one looks at what, what am I, pictures come up. Thoughts, words, attitudes of others toward one, and a long series of photographic-like memories of past events with not just the picture, their feelings and emotions involved. And the fear of that story, picture and memory story of one's life ending. There being no more me. Me, not just the picture story of one's life, one's ideas about oneself and what one wants to become, but all of one's attachments. Which maybe, if one owns things that one is attached to, the parting from those things, those objects, one is attached to people or one person in particular, the thought of not being with that person anymore, not having him or her anymore, the thought of no longer being able to have the experiences of the past that one is attached to as memory, <clears throat> trips into the mountains, or to the seashore, making love, eating good food, exploring things, writing a book, if this fulfills and fills one, and is an attachment, all of that coming to an end, being finished. With this comes a feeling of not so much fear, but sadness, maybe depression. maybe anxiety, one has to explore it, and the words are not the actual state. One has great difficulty in life, great pain, insurmountable pain as it may seem to one, no relationship, no love, loneliness, then one may wish to, to bring it to an end. in which still there is a hope for something better than what is, <clears throat> the absence of that being seen as something better than suffering any longer, and a desire for that state of absence of pain and whatever has all been just mentioned. not wanting to part with the story of one's life, with the continuity of the me and all its attachments. The human mind invents afterlife, new life. It is, there is a variety as, as vast as there have been 
human beings living together. And creating these stories about what happens after life. It's not a recent phenomenon that has happened among people, probably since the dawn of language. To think about something that happens after death, again, trying to bring this unknown into something knowable that one can think of and hope for and therefore get away from the anxiety and uneasiness or uncertainty that we've just talked about, the ending of the me, the not knowing, the not knowing that the idea of, of death implies. There have been all versions of a paradise after death. Where it is imagined all that is needed and wanted will be there or a close proximity to God which actually if one looks at it closely one does not know what it is one has a concept of it but the idea of being close to that God that one conceives of is a comforting one. And there have been all varieties of belief in afterlife, reincarnation, rebirth, which is not just the belief of the Eastern people religions, but it has also occurred in primitive religions. There was such belief in the ancient Greek religion. A belief in continuing, being born anew and continuing as what? leaving alone what other people have believed or are believing to oneself, if that is a, a belief, a meaningful belief, as what does one see oneself continuing? And what is it that continues? Not theoretically, but what, it is, what is it that one desires? to continue as what one is, but without the difficulty, without the problems and conflicts. Or to have a better chance, a better situation or environment in which to resolve those conflicts. If one has or is living with open eyes, which is not difficult to watch what is happening in life, in one's community, in one's country, in one's hemisphere and all over the globe. Maybe one has already lived through, se through several generations and one has the historic accounts of what has happened throughout history, throughout recorded history.
if one looks simply and honestly, what has continued throughout human history as well as in this lifetime is what? Wanting, fearing, greed, anger and violence. Loneliness, need, need for love, for being loved, and all the, all the efforts of power, wanting power to get away from feeling powerless, pleasure, That is what has continued throughout human history. And that is what is reborn all the time. Reborn to and having continued throughout human history is ignorance of all of that. Ignorance in the sense of ignorant of what is the root of it all, what is the cause of it, the creator of it. <coughs> and not knowing, ignorant of it, all the escapes from it, which have not brought about freedom from it. The first thing that came to mind was wanting, because already a little baby born is just one little mass of wanting. Wanting to drink, wanting warmth, wanting touch, the presence of the mother or father, or both, or whoever takes care of it, which, as it grows up, is called wanting attention, wanting the certainty of being loved, wanting to be secure, and having lots of things. Have we changed since then? If one looks deeply within and superficially within in a retreat such as this, it doesn't have to be a retreat. It can be in one's daily life if there's the energy and the, the need to look in daily relationship. Doesn't one run into this wanting, discover this wanting, as one person said, every instant of my life. <laughs> every moment. There it is. Wanting or not wanting, which is the same thing. Not wanting is wanting something else. It dominates our life in one form or another. Wanting affection, love, the approval of others, the acceptance of others, looking into the eyes of others for that. One 
This brings to mind one person in a recent retreat told me that every time he enters the room he looks into my eyes for some confirmation of himself and one day there was nothing to be read in those eyes and there was an anxiety, an instant feeling of insecurity because nothing could be read from those eyes, neither approval nor going toward or against. They were neither confirming, there was nothing there to be interpreted. And anxiety, feeling sort of dislocated, which doesn't happen to have with this person's eyes. This is what we do all the time. And little children already do it. When mother scolds a child or tells the child off, the child doesn't listen to the words. It looks into the eyes of the mother or father or the person. To read them, as it were, of what is brewing, what will come, what will happen. And also, as in the case with this man and in the case with all of us, the confirmation of this me is one always tries to glean it from other people's eyes. How do they look at me? Approvingly or disapprovingly? Lovingly or hatingly? Indifferently? Absent-mindedly? And with this outward barometer, one's state of well-being rises or falls. If one is attached to the image of oneself, and, need, which, and this image is like a bottomless pit, it constantly needs to be braced, reaffirmed, reassured, maintained through the reaction of others. I know there are other ways of maintaining it. I'm not, I can't go into the whole thing. Right now we're looking at this. We talked about identi identification and this before. So here we're looking at a different angle of the same thing. It's not, not just from the eyes of others that one gets either a feeling of being somebody, maybe somebody important, which is what one is very much attached to, to be some, somebody of importance. Doesn't have to be world-renowned but important, taken seriously, somebody special. And that one needs to have confirmed through special attention given one. Special privileges. <coughs> something special. It is this bottomless wanting which comes out of what we have to look at that too. And getting something special, a special attention, a special this or that, a special food, it's, it, it doesn't satisfy one has to have it again because the uncertainty about who one is or the possibility that one may be nobody, which at this moment is an idea, a fearful, frightening idea, constantly generates this wanting to feel one is not just nobody, but somebody. And each one of us likes it confirmed 
in a little bit of a different way, sometimes in a very similar way, and sometimes in a different way. And if the hunger is great, the need is great, there's no space to see. This is just an aside of how one also affects the givers, whether one imposes, whether this involves people in activities that they may not be into but have to do in order to fulfill one's needs. To what, what extent this affects so many people that being under the power of the need, one often has, does not have the, the space to, to even examine or become aware of, and yet it is open to, to inspection, to looking, to thinking about. Which brings the extraordinary size often of one's needs into, if, if this is seen in a larger context of how many people one affects with it, or just one, it may put it into a different perspective. It may be the beginning of looking at this whole thing with new eyes, at this neediness and wanting, which is never fulfilled or fulfillable. through any amount of giving or receiving because it lacks love. Wholeness. understanding of lack, of want, thorough understanding, not just the manifestations of it, but the, the root source of it. Because again, as we have followed it through through all these talks, there is this idea of me as a separate entity which is already lack and want of wholeness. And yet the attachment to that is enormous. Can it be observed and watched and seen and looked into from moment to moment as it operates on oneself and the people around one? Attachment to other people or to an image of oneself as being this or that, attachment to ideas, whatever we went through, all our attachments are ultimately attachment to this me, this strong feeling of being a separate individual entity, which does not deny the existence of this here, which is capable of walking, running, standing, sitting, eating, laughing, and joy as well as sadness without any feeling of being a separate individual, without any image of being I, me, and this, I'm this, I'm that, and then needing respect for being this or that from others, confirmation acceptance, when this image of oneself is not there, all of these demands 
don't have no further need to exist. Even logically, one can see this would simplify matters a lot. <laughs> but it isn't that easy. It's simple. It's utterly simple. But why is it so difficult? Why is it so difficult to even see attachment, let alone drop it? If it's not dropped, it continues as it has continued since time immemorial with all the pleasures and the sorrows it brings in its way. And the absence of genuine love that is not a demand. Love is never a demand or an expectation. It's not a thought. It's not a concept. One cannot meditate on it. Because it's the absence of the meditator either there or it isn't there. And when it is there, it demands nothing. It's totally sufficient and whole unto itself. But it is banished or barred, blocked through all attachment. which involves the image of me versus you and my demands on you and all that ensues from that. Dependency, disappointment, quarrel, hatred. We, we all know it. It doesn't always have to be listed. Someone may say, why don't you say, ever say anything nice about human beings? <laughs> the nice or the joy, pure beauty which is free of self needs not to be talked about. It is already, why talk about it? Although we do mention it at times. But what I mean here is it is not to be described, put into words and therefore squeezed, squeezed <laughs> into narrowness that can again be palpable to thought. Thought wants to own everything and understand it, make it its own. And when there's sheer pure joy or love, there's no thought about owning it or having it or what it is. It is not knowing. So what is dying? Not <coughs> at the end of one's life, when there may be senility 
or some kind of brain disorder already, so there is no possibility for <coughs> awareness. What is dying now? Is it possible to die now? To image? Attachment? Being somebody? Something? really not knowing what one is, if there is no image. You may ask, how do I do that? Or try to push for it. That's the me in operation trying to attain a state <coughs> from which it <coughs> hopes to gain something. <coughs> there's no doing it, because there is no doer, no intention. There can only be attention without knowing. Seeing, seeing profoundly, wanting, and all the consequences of wanting. At a glance, one has been through it so many times, it can be seen at a glance. And can the seeing be the dropping? Or the listening be the dropping? The being, whatever one is this instant, without any idea about it, or fear of the next moment, or hope for the next moment, none of that. No movement of the conditioned mind toward something or away from something. Dying. You know, what continues is always old, always the same, with slight modifications, slight alterations, little changes here and there, but more or less the same as what continues. But what is there when there is no continuing? of an idea, of an attachment, in thought. If we look at nature, which admittedly right now is thinking, a new bud comes when the old leaf and fruit has dropped, Sometimes the old leaves are still hanging on, some trees. But the new bud that's there is not the old leaf, is not the old fruit. It can only be something new when something old ends. 
and doesn't continue. <clears throat> When it continues, it takes over the new and makes it old. One can see that in one's thoughts. <clears throat> Seeing something new and immediately scanning what is it to try to impose upon it what one knows. Can one look again? Listen anew? inwardly and outwardly not under the influence and power of old ideas and attachments and images is it humanly possible If not, the stream continues. Stream of thought, self, sorrow, and ignorance. Or ignorance and sorrow. and the blockage of the life energy in this ignorance and sorrow. When there's something new, energy flows. Because it's not tied up in knots. It's not blocked. And it has no direction. Because there's no director. Where are we now? Let us end here for today. <clears throat>